Thank you, Curtis. Our next speaker is Martin Rama. Martin is the former chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank. He was previously the chief economist for South Africa, lead economist for Vietnam, and director of the 2013 World Development Report on Jobs. He is the co-author, along with Yui Lee, of Private Cities, Implications for Urban Policy in Developing Countries. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Paris, Sorbonne. Yu Li is a senior economist at the World Bank. Prior to joining the World Bank's Global Investment Climate Unit, she worked in the office of the chief economist for South Asia and was also a co-author on the 2013 World Development Report. She is the co-author, along with Martin Rama, of Private Cities, Implications for Urban Policy in Developing Countries. She has a PhD in economics from Rutgers University. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, uh, joint work then uh, with UA, and we will be alternating uh, in this presentation. We'll try to keep it short. We know that uh, we are running late. It, this, what I will be presenting with UA this morning uh, is the result of a long research project that started uh, when uh, we were both uh, uh, in South Asia, I was the chief economist for that region, and UA was uh, in that team. Uh, and is coming up under the form of a book. We were hoping to have it ready for you to download today. Uh, it's coming up hopefully on March 20, and we will uh, send you uh, all the link. And this research started uh, from a realization while being in South Asia of something that I must say was uh, new to me. I'm uh, from, from South America. Uh, is that uh, unlike perhaps charter cities, private cities are a reality in South Asia, you can see them. That's one of them, that's Gurgaon. And that metro is a private metro, is infrastructure privately built. Uh, so let me start uh, with, with the motivation. I think I will not uh, stay long here. We all know that urbanization is the most important transformation happening in the world these days, and yet it is under-delivering in the developing world. We see relatively low urbanization rates, we see excess primacy, when there's a city that functions, it becomes uh, sprawling and messy. We see urban underperformance, and there are plenty of studies that document these. And there is this realization that a common source of all these problems is the weak capacity of local governments uh, to do uh, what they should be doing as, as urban leaders. This is not to say that people are not capable, but institutionally, uh, it's very difficult to assemble land, uh, you have institutional fragmentation, you have too many agencies together uh, stepping on, on, on each other's toes, you don't have land registers, land regulations, good cadastres. So the, we are expecting a lot from urbanization, but the government units in charge of that uh, are hampered to, uh, to deliver. And the flip side of it is the appearance of private cities. So why we use the, the, the title private cities to emphasize that the agency before, behind the urbanization is not coming from a government actor, it's coming from a non-government actor. In some exceptional cases, it might be a government actor from a different country, and is one of the cases we call it. And our definition of private cities is not a, a, a word that, uh, a term that we invented, we are just running with it because we find it very compelling, uh, is that these are major urban areas uh, in whose uh, development uh, a, a non-government actor played a very important area, so, role. So major means we are not talking about gated communities, we are not talking about industrial parks, we are not talking about mega slums, business industry, uh, improvement districts. The 14 cities, private cities we study in this report with detail have a median population of 900,000. So we are talking real cities, places that connect uh, jobs and, and people. And then there is a non-government actor, but we want to stay on a broader concept of private actor because it's not just large developers. We have examples in which these major private companies, Tata in the case of India, for example, we have cases where it's a, 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 business, a, a business association, uh, we have a couple of them, and we have even cases where it's civil society that takes urbanization in its own hands, uh, in, uh, in, in a bit the way that uh, uh, Paul presented in, in his opening. We get the feeling that there are these untapped opportunities. There is an arbitrage opportunity, and in some cases, uh, when governments are very weak, uh, it, it happens and someone uh, takes the, the idea. 
Now, like Mark, I would say, historically, we can find many examples of this, and one could even claim that cities run by governments is part of development, like the, the, the Westphalia and the city nation, that most cities, uh, or many cities in, throughout history, were run by some of these private actors. Paris was run by the Guild of the Boatsmen Association. You still have it in the logo of the city. Uh, Florence, one could argue, was the city of the Medici family. Uh, there was a, the whole Garden Cities movement that was utopian intellectuals, but uh, they, they put it in practice. Company towns were common throughout the Industrial Revolution. Edge cities, now the developers that take uh, around the existing cities, uh, big entities. And uh, more recently, one case we, we point out that will seem surprising uh, is in, in France, which is not a, a place that you will suspect to be very inclined to live in the private sector, uh, lead the urbanization, uh, is the area of Saclay, south of Paris, where NIMBYSM has played such a big role uh, that uh, it's, uh, so you have 44 communes that each of them has full authority over their own area, that nobody can uh, take advantage of that. But then a, a bunch of research campuses, public, semi-public, private, has taken over. 15% of the R&D of France comes from Saclay, which is uh, not a city as such. These are examples of Washington, D.C. One will think of Washington, D.C. as the quintessential government city, planned by a Frenchman in, in 1800 with all the avenues and all that. Well, a big chunk of D.C. area today is a private city. When you go from Dallas Airport uh, to the city center, you're basically crossing uh, a, a private city. So all of these are uh, private developments in Washington, D.C. So this to say that uh, historically and advanced economies, in fact, we have a lot of examples of private actors taking the lead on urbanization, but we are so used to the idea that, oh, there are government jurisdictions for every locality uh, and governments with capacity in, develop in, in advanced economies that we think, okay, urbanization will be done uh, led by... Uh, the, the private sector. So these, uh, these are examples across the developing world of uh, the cities. These are the 14 cities that in the second part of the study we document with a very common, like the database that Curtis was referring to, except that is a qualitative database for every city, what was the process, who was behind, what was the land assembly, and so on and so forth. And you see that these cities are in countries at different development levels, in um, places with different cultural, historic traditions. Um, so uh, there is something with different political systems. Uh, there is, again, something about untapped opportunities that see the emergence of these entities. In each case here, it may be difficult to see from the distance. There is a name of the private actor that is behind uh, this development. Now, one can say is private city is a contradiction in terms as a term. Uh, we, we like it because it creates a bit of cognitive dissonance. We, we are citizens through living in cities. So what is this thing about private cities? It seems uh, like a contradiction. Now, we are used to the idea that the coordinator, the spatial coordinator, is, is government. But as Stiglitz uh, pointed out in 1977, anything that a government does on a spatial scale, a private developer uh, can do. And so one of the things we discuss in, in, in the book as an introduction is the relationship to to the different ways to think about allocation of resources, where basically in the 30s we had the welfare economics tradition, is you go through incentives, uh, the socialist tradition, you have a planner, and the law and economics tradition is you have deals that uh, you enforce through, through, through uh, the, the judicial system. And in some way, uh, the urban debate has been more or less locked into the more socialist economics tradition. So we talk about urban planners. is one of the areas in which we really talk about planners. But uh, we build our, our book also on the, on the work of uh, Ronald Coase on lighthouses, when he, he takes something that is, the, again, the quintessential example of something is a public good provided by government, and uh, explains how in, in Great Britain they were run by the private sector. How, how did that work? And so we do that not to say this is what it should be, is we are starting from a fact that has been underappreciated. Uh, having worked at the World Bank, uh, we see that clearly we don't work with the cities for a couple of reasons. One is our counterparts at the World Bank are governments, so they are not 
uh, our typical counterparts. And second, some of these private actors are not people who are very palatable. You don't want to be very close to them. So we try to keep distance. But as a result of that, as, as Curtis said, we don't have enough information or enough knowledge because we're not so much engaged with them. Um, so what the book does is it goes through an analytical model to have a, a, a conceptual structure uh, to build upon. We build inventories of private cities in four countries just to have a sense of the scale uh, of, the, of the, the, these entities. And then we have 14 cities across the developing world, nine of them with a full background paper, the others uh, with a desk uh, uh, review. So let me turn to UA for the core of the book and I come back with the implications of it. Thanks, Martin. Sorry, uh, my voice is a bit coarse and then just tell me if you cannot hear it clearly. Um, you know, as an economist, we try to think of an even simple model to guide our thinking when we look at the issue. Uh, so uh, we look at the literature uh, thinking, okay, what has been done in terms of thinking about uh, city formation or birth of cities? So um, in general, a lot of uh, uh, models with mi micro foundations in the field, you have firms, you have household organically moved to places, but also it's well recognized that in this type of uncoordinated uh, city formation format, there will be externalities and uh, you know, stay untapped. So generally also in the model, especially start with Henderson, they would thinking about uh, entrepreneurial spatial uh, coordinator. And they recognize that especially built on the uh, history of the US, he even have a paper on edge cities, which Martin mentioned. But in, in general, when they um, build these type of models, the, the private developer, all the, all the uh, private uh, uh, coordinator is kind of just a substitute to the uh, government or local government. So there is not so much interaction between the two. Uh, exception is, uh, um, you know, Housley and, uh, uh, you know, Coulson's paper. But there, when they're looking at it, it's not uh, the city scale we're talking about, not so much about productivity uh, increasing scale. It's more like a community, more like a gated community. So that's kind of the literature in terms of, uh, in general, curricular uh, in terms of urban economics. Then we also look at the political science when they look, like the, uh, look at the city formation. Again, a lot of people on the U.S. history, uh, in contrast to the uh, economics literature, they do recognize this interplay between the two, two, uh, two parts, the lower government and the, uh, the uh, developers and the private sector, even uh, civil society, recognize that you know, thinking about local government as the sole power player is, is not uh, sufficient. So, uh, you know, in this simple model, we try to combine uh, those two lines of literature, take a political economy approach, and uh, uh, for, form uh, uh, after um, Housley and the uh, co-authors uh, kind of uh, formulate a game uh, between uh, two larger players rather than one. Uh, the one side is uh, the local government, the other side is, uh, we call it a private developer. But as Martin mentioned, you can see others in common. So this is, I, I won't go to much detail given the crowd and time, uh, but you know, the beginning is, is, you know, what is this game about? What they produce, we call it, we fix the locality. And so the price is um, more or less set up by the external you know, environment. So it's relatively small, but isn't for city scale. And then also th what the outcome is a uh, high quality urban land. So uh, decoded as L and then, you know, F, generates a function, so from high quality urban land, you will have, um, you know, say output as a locality. Uh, we take this function, try to incorporate again, the uh, economies of scale, uh, so it's upward slope, but at the same time, the marginal return decline over time because the congestion forces, so, you know, cities don't all, all grow, you know, in, indefinitely. And then uh, here, the next line, uh, we have the two players both come in, so the public sector development land and the private sector actor also can, can do. And then the, the two uh, parts of the land are equivalent in terms of how we see it at the locality. At the same time, there are also um, two different objectives in terms of uh, the government side and the private side. So the government, you know, we call it the benevolent, so you want to ex uh, maximize the surplus of the locality. So it's a difference between uh, the cost that uh, you use to produce land, both the 
the uh, government part and the local uh, private developed land and the total output. So that's the difference. The you know, you, you may notice like we highlight the theta part. So the theta we use introduced here as a very interesting institutional par parameter to capture the fact that the local government is weak. So it's less than one. So you, you perhaps you know, the, in the most ideal case of urban economics, you could be one is produced the best land, but as in most cases not. And then uh, for the private investor, uh, they try to max, uh, maximize their rent. Uh, so it depends on their own land pr produced. So LP, not the whole part. But at the same time, the, the price is, uh, depends on how big a city is. So it's marginal return to the whole, whole land. And then also you notice uh, we introduce another institutional parameter here, mu. Uh, that represents what uh, Martin gave you the very interesting term, a cloud of the private sector. And then we then use uh, uh, kind of cases to try to bring meaning of it. And then finally, we don't model the, the firms, uh, the, the, the household, and then we lump it together, even the stakeholder of the original landowner. And the difference between the rent and the uh, uh, local uh, surplus is kind of uh, appropriated by, by the rest. Sorry to uh, be long, but um, so here, uh, in, you know, we try to say, okay, when we introduce this type of, especially those two institutional parameters, what do we see? So we see is the first uh, figure is if we assume the government is 100% capable, and then uh, we will you know, reach uh, optimal city size you know, when the marginal return equals to, to, to the cost. Uh, but if, for instance, if we look at what the, uh, the slope uh, alpha here represent, if you know, despite the, the locality is profitable, can should grow, but uh, both the government and the private, private sector find it's not profitable or optimal to develop, then we stay as rural. So that's uh, definitely uh, not optimal. And then if you move to the second uh, figure is where we assumed there is no private sector in, in, into play, only the government and, and the uh, produce uh, land here. And then because the uh, theta is less than one, it's not, uh, it's weak capacity, then you will say we'll have cities smaller because the wasteful development, because they're not as efficient. The last one is we assume the opposite. If only private sector have the capacity to come in, the private, public sector just uh, too inefficient to even come in, um, but at the same time, because our objective of the private sector is different, you also have inefficiency. I won't get into detail. And then with the game play, because non-coordinated game, uh, we have additional uh, waste. And then, um, and then we have two type of uh, uh, you know, uh, games. One is uh, simultaneously uh, played. In that case, uh, we will have four type of equilibria on this uh, locality. One is, I mentioned, you know, the, uh, maybe look at the uh, lower left side is rural area, basically. Nobody uh, decides this profitable, despite it has high potential. And then you go a little bit to the right, counterclockwise, we would have potentially conventional city. Again, the private sector may not find it profitable to come in. And then you depends on uh, you know what kind of game we play. If it's really simultaneously, we have what we call mixed city, basically both players come in. Or if we have, uh, for instance, the government <coughs> move together, first mover, and then we, we would have strategic city. Basically, the government try to actually produce less and then uh, a crowd in the private sector. Private sector. Finally, we would have, if the government stay inactive uh, and the private sector has really big cloud, we would have a company town or developer city. So yeah, uh, this I would be really quick. I won't get to the detail. It pretty much shows all the uh, equili uh, equilibrium I just talked about in different type of games. But the intuition here we want to show with those figures, if you notice uh, this, um, uh, th this diagram is on the um, you know, x-axis. Uh, we show the, uh, the capacity of local government from very low to high. And then, you know, depends on that, you will see uh, the different equilibrium appear. And then on the y-axis, uh, we uh, similarly, uh, we show the, the private sector uh, cloud, similarly from very low to high. And then uh, we found out first is intuition, right? Those two interplay, you have different equilibrium. And secondly, we, we, we uh, calculated, found out it will be unique mapped when there is different unique map of this. So again, kind of maybe too abstract for this crowd, but I, uh, you know what, uh, you know, bottom we to say is we use this to guide our thinking to see, okay, if we, in reality, we have weak local government capacity, which is generally not recognized in reality, and we have the uh, private sector may have a, a, a powerful cloud, 
how would the equilibrium evolve, and they help us to, to then go on to look at uh, you know a group of the uh, rea uh, real examples uh, we'll see uh, in, in later, and also uh, Martin will, will uh, discuss how this can be used to thinking about the different uh, approaches of resource allocation and health policy implication. Um, yeah, similar to the uh, Charter Cities uh, uh, efforts, at the beginning of this, you know, 2019, 2020, we work with our uh, local colleagues to try to gather uh, data of private cities across four uh, countries. We start with actually much more than this, and then uh, we set a threshold of uh, uh, 2.5 square kilometer and at least one uh, major private actor and mixed land use. And then we end up with uh, this collection. So this is about like 80, uh, 88 uh, private cities uh, across those four countries, uh, different uh, background culture, as uh, you know, uh, Martin mentioned, it's diverse in that sense. And also uh, they uh, occupy about 4% of uh, overall city numbers and 2% of, of overall urbanization, uh, urban population. Uh, uh, collecting for those four countries. And then for those four countries, we then selected the uh, two or uh, one uh, outstanding uh, cities to do more qualitative in-depth analysis. And combined with that, because again, COVID, everything, so we then uh, did, we could not do this type of inventory for all c uh, countries. So we then combined with just uh, uh, selected outstanding uh, cities. So those are the 14 that you see uh, at the beginning of the map. And then uh, for qualitative uh, analysis, we asked a few questions. The first is, you know, what are the necessary conditions, if not sufficient, for them to emerge? So one is perhaps obvious to everyone here in this cloud is advantage, advantageous locations. What at least here we don't have need to get into uh, detail is first they are generally relatively close to existing metropolitan area. Or, uh, for instance, in the case of India, Jamshedpur. Uh, it's a steel town uh, built by a uh, Tata uh, group, so it's close to their resources, mining resources, just like the uh, historical mining towns. But uh, it's not showing here in the book is we also observe the importance of uh, the time dimension, we kind of uh, come back to what Paul mentioned at the beginning, is this you know, uh, uh, unpredictability. You know, just surrounding uh, uh, Delhi, there could be other locations, but why go down, why that time? It's basically, you also have the word economic called the shocks. So it could be very general shocks. So just you know, there is this urbanization trend that you know uh, the other speaker talk about uh, across the whole continent. That's what we see in, in the first one. East, uh, East Dhaka was Dhaka. Uh, East Dhaka is just a, a, a land of currently uh, constantly flooded. So nobody pay attention to it before. But now there is a strong dynamism next to it. So there is forces for the private sector to uh, to to fill in the land uh, uh, fill fill the land with sand to even develop. And then in terms of size, is uh, now already uh, 500,000 people live there, close to, believe it or not, for such a big country uh, to its uh, 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 secondary city, basically ranked at 10, uh, number 10 cities. Uh, similarly, in, in the case of uh, Delhi, uh, Gogang, where is, there is this demand from the US to, to, to do the, um, you know, uh, their back office outsourcing, but they couldn't have a, a, a commercial spaces to the, to, to do that. Right? It doesn't, you know, your phone calls are not picked up by people that just from work remotely, you know, decades away, right? So they need a commercial space, but they couldn't have it in Delhi because of land regulation. So what they did then is find, it's basically the developer had that vision, uh, hook up, uh, connected with uh, uh, the uh, CEO and then uh, decided, that, okay, we don't just do residential, we will build up uh, the plug and play uh, infrastructure so the FDI can come. So that's why, you know, this, this story of a uh, uh, service integration, service FDI actually have a space to start with. That's why Gorgang is the IT hub for the whole country. So I won't get into all the details. Um, so, and then it's connected, second one is what we, again, this model helped us in the, to, 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 to see, okay, what exactly this weak uh, government uh, capacity means. So, and <coughs> interestingly, we found it's, it's not just always absolute weak capacity. It is the most dominant one, but sometimes it's, it's deliberate uh, neglect. That's the case uh, we see in, in Selkot of uh, Pakistan. Selkot historically was very dynamic. 
you know, or produce a lot of manufactured goods because of colonial history. But it is the right to very close to the border uh, to, to India. So it's vulnerable in many cases. So the central government doesn't want to invest a lot in the infrastructure. But because the local economy developed, has the local dynamism, then the local uh, uh, private sector decide, okay, we take, our hands, uh, take things into our own hands, we develop again. So that's a deliberate neglect. And then the last one is proactive crowd in. So it kind of maybe I'll give the China example since Shenzhen has been talked so much, right? So the Shenzhen case, you have the, the provincial government gather all the most talented people from China to invest in it. But there are other localities like uh, Guan, right? I think uh, Joe has not more about it. Basically, we build on uh, her story and uh, across her story is that you, you, know, you also have those uh, localities. They also want to develop. They also want to tap into this whole growth happening in China. And it's uh, very close to, to Beijing. And uh, also uh, around that time when they developed early 2000, is the, the, the central government uh, decided, okay, we don't want mega cities that are too uh, sprawl. Instead, we want to develop satellite, satellite cities. So they gave some policy preference. But the local government like Guan, they don't have the capacity to develop it. So what they find out is, okay, actually there are private developers. They can help us to, to, uh, to plan, to implement, also even to attract uh, other uh, businesses, you know, in the airspace, uh, airspace uh, uh, and in, in terms of high tech. So they, they pattern up. So that's kind of a proactive crowd in, even in the case of China, on average, the capacity is high. Okay. Um, and then finally, the private uh, sector, I think, uh, you know, uh, in addition to the, the, the diverse in terms of who they are, you range from Tata to, to maybe, you know, private developers who was uh, sued by in the court, uh, you also have what they do is different. Um, you know, they sometimes have a capacity to implement on a scale, which uh, I think given the time, I won't uh, get in, into detail or talk about it when I talk about their functions. And finally, so we also see that generally there is some institutional arrangement. As Martin, Martin mentioned, right, so it's kind of innovative arrangement. Private cities may differ across countries, but generally there are some in, uh, innovative uh, institutional arrangement. For instance, in the uh, case of Batam, Indonesia. So this is, again, Singapore has been uh, talked about, but maybe less known about Batam. Batam is not very far from Singapore. And then it, uh, you know, uh, really uh, took off uh, because Singapore found out that the land price, labor price was just too high. So they need to find other places. So there are both their uh, local uh, business people and uh, even foreign investors from uh, Japan, so on and so forth, can still uh, find it profitable. At the same time, uh, uh, Indonesia government want to develop Batam. They started first, you know, it's resource-rich countries. So they started first with SOE, you know, uh, Panapintana, but it doesn't work. And then, uh, you know, the two governments work together, uh, work out uh, different arrangements. Initially, even, you know, for Batam is uh, they have the um, Batam Industry Development Authority report directly to the, uh, uh, to the president. Later on, with political uh, changes, reform, then they uh, uh, report directly to the board of ICEZ. But still, they have authority over the municipal government. Actually, the municipal government come later, uh, but then evolve and in the local constituency uh, evolve. Uh, so basically that's, again, and then the, uh, on the Singapore side is the single government, Singapore government, as we all know, has a lot of government uh, uh, linked companies. So the single government actually, you know, form a consultant, uh, con uh, cons uh, a group of uh, Singapore government, both as industrial park developers and as investors uh, to do investment, the initial inv flagship industrial park development uh, you know, at, uh, at bottom. So that's how things uh, started. So the Guban wins is we want to show the evolve, uh, you know, this, this change of government uh, at, at Guogang. It started with the dotted line, it's a hypothetical proxy of the, the, how small it's, it was. It's just a village, a barren land, not even very fertile. And then in the 2008, uh, almost two decades after the city grew, it grew into municipal corporation. So that's, again, it's, it was rural. And then it superimposed the municipal corporation don't have a lot of uh, authority. And then now they have even uh, uh, metropolitan development authority, much larger area. So, so again, this institutional arrangement of creativity is very important. It's also evolved, generally evolved over time. 
And then uh, uh, very quickly on the functions, right? So mm, because what another thing we, we, we select these 14 is we call them you know, outstanding uh, uh, private cities. Generally, they are quite dynamic, quite successful uh, economically. You know, Gurgaon's case is a top 10 city in terms of uh, per capita income and accounted for up 2% of the country's GDP, 70% of the Haryana state's GDP. So it's not insignificant. And uh, so what they do, the private sector, right? So we, we, we talk about in the model, the cloud, in a way to get land, but also you know, their, their implementation capacity we mentioned. So in terms of the functions, uh, Martin divide them into two. One is traditional functions, the, the one we think a local government do, right? They assemble land, uh, you know, build the, the truck infrastructure, truck infrastructure expected uh, enhancing connecti connectivity, and then uh, uh, planning and service delivery. We found that first is obviously those developers generally have a high capacity in terms of land use planning and service delivery. So that's kind of a core, um, you know, again, this case, the, in many cases, they, they have the capacity, not just residential, to provide the uh, plug and play system. So for domestic and for, uh, foreign investor to just come and invest. So. And secondly, uh, they, uh, they also involved in land assembly. Uh, in some cases, is, you know, uh, the, the government support, for instance, Batam's case, the government initially uh, just saying, okay, the, the, this uh, BIDA, the uh, Batam Industrial Development Authority, you will have the, the authority to allocate the land. You don't have to go back to the province uh, to, to go through the whole process to reduce the cost. And, uh, 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 but in terms of connectivity, we'll find it interesting. I won't give more cases, it's just the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the figure uh, of the, uh, at the cover of the book, is right? So in most cases, it's true, it's actually the public sector provide connectivity. All the private sector kind of tap into existing, uh, you know, connectivity. That's what actually happened in, 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 in this area too. Oh, they know the plan, right? So the, this uh, zero lands planned for decades. So resting is there, so, so on and so forth. But, but at the same time, their private sector also being forced into do this, or negotiated and uh, tried to help with connectivity. That's what happened in Honduras. Uh, um, and also what happened uh, in, in Gogan's case, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the first private metro line was built uh, in, in, in that case. And the second part is the non-traditional function. That's generally what don't think the, 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 the government, local government do or have the capacity to do. One is business development. Uh, the other we call it political activism. For instance, I won't get detail again, it's just collaboration between the Indo uh, Indonesia and the Singapore government. They make a deal to think how to make it work. Business development, I will use the, uh, sh just as Guan as example, is those are the industrial park that the, the, the uh, you know the developer build. But at the same time, is how significant in terms of b business uh, attraction is. They have uh, uh, approximately three thousand people, just pr in terms of professionally try to identify what other potential sectors a locality can attract, and then try to actively help them to, to do that. So um, yeah, let me stop here. Thanks. As, as we are running late, let me try to be brief. One of the, the big issues is, so you have these cities developing, being successful, uh, so who gets a surplus uh, of them? Uh, which was the, the point that Astrid <coughs> raised. Are these cities for the rich? Uh, and, uh, sorry. Uh, maybe going too far. Yeah, sorry. So we, we find that there are different ways in which there are uh, attempts to share this surplus so that it's not just a private actor that gets it. The most obvious one is taxing income in the locality, but there are other, other alternatives, selling rights to the city, sharing the surplus directly with uh, stakeholders, and finally, some kind of confrontation. Let me just give you examples. This is uh, the prospect for uh, DACA. Uh, is DACA being a part of the city that is in the hands of, uh, of large developers? And there is a lot of tax revenue that can be uh, retained, that can be gained back. What is interesting is that a lot of it comes from general taxation, not from property taxes, which is what we will expect, because the systems, even assuming here, is assuming that the, the, the regulations in force and the cadastre, everything is right. You don't get a lot from uh, property taxes. Another possibility is to sell the rights to the city. So as the government gives uh, to, to, to someone how, how to do that. And there are different uh, ways of doing it. One is licensing, land concessions. Basically, you sell. Uh, it takes low risk to the government. It's basically the buyer who is taking the risk. The other is under the form of joint ventures. 
uh, which are PPPs are, are an example, uh, but they take very different forms. In the case of Sialkot in Pakistan, where the private sector built the airport, uh, it was a, a project-specific PPP. In the case of Guan in China, it was a city uh, PPP. 50 years, the city is yours, and then you, you, you give it back, and we compensate you annually for what you do. Or in the case of Fumi Hung, again, very interesting that this is a in a country where the, the, the Communist Party was leading an agreement with the Kuomintang in Taiwan to try to develop a new city. And it's basically a 99-year joint venture where 70% of the profits uh, go to the private developer, 30% to the city. Uh, but there are other ways, like in Gurgaon, which is the, the case Yue was referring to, one of the ways to share the surplus was uh, with the local communities that were there. These are villages. These dots are villages within one. And basically, residents were offered the possibility of keeping their villages, and they had a lot of land appreciation. Or in some cases, they were offered the exchange of their land for shares in the company uh, behind Guan. So this was a different form. And finally, is conflict. A lot happens through courts. Uh, a, a lot, uh, um, I think, as Astrid was saying, you have cases where the government can change its mind the day after. So uh, there is a lot that is uh, political. This is the famous banana strike of 1954 in San Pedro Sula. Uh, San Pedro Sula, one of our private cities, is uh, basically what coined the name Banana Republic. Okay? And the surplus was being appropriated entirely by the banana companies until this happened. And then the banana companies went away. And then San Pedro Sula had to transform itself into a maquila a manufacturing hub because it had lots of labor that was very cheap and it had you know, infrastructure. So just to Two words on policy implications. First, let me go back to the analytical model that you have presented. If you take that analytical model, what do you get from it uh, in terms of what you could do to get better outcomes? Uh, first, what we try to do at places like the World Bank is let's increase the capacity of the local government because if inefficiency comes from low capacity, and that's the obvious answer. But it's less obvious when you are in a game theoretical uh, setting. Because if you increase the capacity of the government, the government does more, but it also crowds out more the more efficient developer. For low levels of capacity in this little model, we show that increasing capacity of the local government, in fact, can uh, uh, be uh, welfare diminishing. Banning the private actor may sound tempting, but in fact, again, it's suboptimal. Because in many cases, you remain rural. You don't even have a company town. So you don't get urbanization. The welfare economics response would be, let's subsidize the private actor, because the private actor is not, why is that the private actor doesn't do more? Because the private actor does not internalize all of the, 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 the effects. It is a windfall for others. But that's very tricky, too, because you have to subsidize a lot. Think of Amazon in, 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 in cities in, in the US. You have to subsidize a lot to get some optimality. Uh, and, and there, the surplus ends up being, if, if you want to be Pareto efficient, you have to capture a lot back. And thinking that a government with weak capacity will be able to capture a lot back from a powerful developing, a developing country, I think it's, it's a bit naive. So what is left as an option is to really sell the rights of the city. Uh, the, the way Guan uh, in China or, or, or Saigon, uh, Fumi Hung, uh, did with Fumi Hung. Um, we also look at the other aspects, which are not the monetary aspects of the surplus, in which these cities may be suboptimal. Uh, one of them is environmental. Uh, and you will imagine, why, why will a private actor care so much about the, the environment? Uh, and so from that perspective, we have many examples of very bad outcomes. East Dhaka is one that is extremely, is, is an environmental hazard directly. But, but it's not always like that. Because in some cases, these private actors have the, the greenery as part of the value proposition. So several of these 14 cities have won international awards for being sustainable. So it's a double-edged. Second, same as Astrid. Look at Equa Atlantic, look at Lagos. These are two different worlds. So the second one is the segregation. And sure, but we also find a but. These cities create lots of jobs. S uh, most often we see around them messy cities that develop almost spontaneously because they are employment opportunities. And so there is a lot of, uh, of, of upward mobility. The last one, for which we cannot find a but, there are, there are no mitigating circumstances where we, we are in trouble, is the kind of institutional secession that, that we see, the, the end of the Westphalia uh, Treaty. 
is in many of these cases, for instance, one of the assets of the cities is security in places that are not very secure. The presumption of innocence, I can tell you, functions very different in some of these cities. In some other cases, there are religious beliefs, or you cannot drink alcohol or, or things like that. So that's something that really, if we are going to go in the direction of thinking uh, private cities, needs to be addressed. So we end with a protocol, tentative protocol. This is a part of our research. Not to advocate that uh, you should have private cities, but just to have like a decision tree. First, is your place really your location, something that may justify a city? Uh, second, do you have a private actor that has the capacity and the, the expertise? In fact, there is a lot of heterogeneity. One could be comfortable if your actor is, say, the government of Singapore, less comfortable with some other uh, actors. Uh, third is which functions are you delegating? Because it's not necessarily everything. You may say you take infrastructure, you take business development. Uh, fourth is you need to think beforehand how you, you will do land value capture for this to be uh, Pareto efficient. Fifth, you need incentives and regulation for these other things, the environmental thing, the social things. We have examples, one of our examples in Indonesia, Indonesia is a country that has sought a lot uh, after the end of the Suharto regime on how to deal with these players and how, for instance, to force affordable housing. So one of our cities is a, has very good uh, record in terms of affordable housing, so it can be done. And finally, finally the, the, the most difficult part, and is where we will continue working on this with UA, which is the PPP deal. This is one of the trickiest PPPs you can do because the sunk costs are huge and the politics are very vulnerable. Part of the politics, we see most of the cities becoming conventional cities because you have a constituency. After some point, you have people. And so what kind of commitment you can have on, on what you do is one of the most difficult questions. So we will not be convinced that PPPs are the way to go in all cases. We think that we suspect that in many cases they will not be viable. So um, thank you very much. Sorry that uh, we went longer uh, than... <laughs>